This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. When the World Trade Towers fell, President George Bush advised Americans what to do go shopping. If we don't keep filling our lives with an endless parade of stuff, we all know what happens anarchy and famine. But the emissions, the waste, the pollution, we are shopping the planet to death and we know it. Can we ever escape these consumer lives? So a few years ago, I interviewed the Canadian journalist J.B. McKinnon about his co-authored book, and that became a movement, The 100-Mile Diet, A Year of Local Eating. Now he's back with his latest book, The Day the World Stops Shopping, How Ending Consumerism Saves the Environment and Ourselves. From Vancouver, Canada, James McKinnon, welcome back to Radio EcoShock. Glad to be back here. Well, of course, the whole world needs to keep making and buying stuff. We can't stop, except for a brief moment in time, we just did. James, what did we learn from the pandemic shutdowns? I think we learned some extraordinary things. We learned that uh, if we stop consuming at such a high rate, we get bluer skies. We get uh, clearer, clearer stars in the night sky. We get uh, an, a very abrupt and deep drop in carbon emissions. We start to see uh, a resurgence in the vitality of the natural world. We also saw some really dramatic changes in ourselves. Uh, we immediately started making sure that we had contact with our family and friends. We really saw what was vitally important to us during the pandemic. Uh, we started to pursue things like creative expression and personal excellence. And there, it was really dramatic how quickly all of that came about. Well, those are things you cannot buy, obviously. I wonder, though, did online shopping grow to the same level as previous in-store shopping, or does uh, going virtual result in somewhat less consumerism? No, I mean, really, over the whole span of the pandemic, we saw people make a turn back towards consumerism. It's, it's what we know best, and uh, we reinvented it for the pandemic circumstances. So we did see, in fact, an increase in the sale of goods, for example. There was a, a steep decline in, in uh, the purchase of services because we simply couldn't access those. And we fulfilled that uh, with, we replaced that, I suppose, with uh, the consumption of goods and with the consumption of watchables. Um, we streamed more than we have ever streamed before on uh, online. You know, we recently did a show about degrowth. You literally searched the world to find what a de-consumer society could look like. Why don't you give us the example that you found in Japan? And that's a country that's known for its shopping and luxury brands. Yeah, what's happening in Japan right now is remarkable. They've really gone about 30 years without much growth to speak of. There's been brief periods of growth, but for the most part, they're economy has been in something like a steady state. I ended up going to uh, an island called Sado Island, um, and it's a place that not only has seen degrowth, but has seen deep, serious depopulation. So it's lost about half of its population. And that gives you a window into what would happen if we draw, drew down consumption by a significant degree. And what you see there is simply the reinvention of society, not, not its collapse, but its reinvention. And you see people uh, turning towards more self-provisioning in their lives, uh, often growing their own food or organizing daycare for their children, things like that, creating their own forms of entertainment. You saw a shift from big resort-style tourism to smaller-scale tourism, small-scale restaurants, um, to some people, it's heaven, and to some people, it's, uh, it's, it's not what they're looking for. You know, they, they want the, the high excitement and the thrills of downtown Tokyo, the difference being that what's going on in Sato Island is, is profoundly sustainable, and what's happening in downtown uh, Tokyo is not. So if you had to choose maybe the top few most damaging things about this consumer economy, what would you tell people about? 
Well, I would certainly say that, that uh, climate change is powerfully driven by consumption. Uh, carbon emissions track very closely with GDP, and the GDP, of course, is, is driven by consumerism. Uh, but, I mean, it, it really extends to, to everything. Consumerism pervades the way we eat. It pervades uh, the, the effect we have on forests, on water. Uh, you name a, an environmental problem, and, and consumption is a powerful driver of that. But I would also say uh, that some of the worst effects are, are upon ourselves, uh, you know, we are driven more and more to be consumers rather than, for example, participants. As uh, I, I took note in the book of a, the world's largest experiment in participatory culture just outside of London, England. And it was really affecting to see what happens when people have an opportunity to, to participate in all kinds of activities in their daily lives that are beyond the earn and spend cycle uh, as compared to, you know, lives that are consumed by, consumed by consumption. So there are people, uh, both in distant cultures, but uh, right around here, looking for alternatives. And what sort of pathways can we find? What I really concluded through this, this search around the globe for examples of glimpses, I suppose, of what uh, post-consumer society might look like is that we, we need to build this. It's not a question of making changes so much in our personal lives. We've seen through history uh, movements towards simpler living, towards decluttering, towards voluntary simplicity and downshifting. These things have come and gone, and it seems really difficult to have them stick and endure uh, for very long within the framework of consumer society. And what we can do is start to transform that society itself so that lower consumption is built into it. And then we, we get the benefits of a lower consuming society without each of us having to, to struggle through it as an individual choice. We want to think that continuing disasters, and we do have them, will persuade people to wake up and, and change their consumer ways. But uh, in the book, you quote retired anthropologist Richard Wilk, and he said this about consumerism. It thrives in situations of instability and contradiction on social disruption and individual mobility as resource depletion ravages this planet. I wonder, are we going to soothe our troubles by shopping even more? Is shopping... And now a rebellious act? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a really counterintuitive idea, but materialism really kicks in when we feel like, we're, like, our, like our material security is under threat. I mean, it, it makes a certain amount of sense. You want to have materialist values. Um, you want to get out there and, and, and sort out how you're going to put food on the table and a roof over your head when you feel your... your your uh, material existence is actually threatened. Um, so, you know, this points towards solutions like, like greater equality, greater equality of opportunity in, in uh, employment, greater equality in the distribution of income. These sorts of things that give more people more security are actually what can help us draw down consumption as well. Your book took me to something that I have never understood reading the Wall Street Journal or any other financial media, and that is that there's going to be some people who are going to work hard and produce things on the other side of the world. And then here in the wealthy countries, our job is to buy things. And so 70% of our economy is consumerism. But really, that just sounds nuts. I mean, there's no God-given right for one part of the planet to work and the other part of the planet to get all the stuff. Uh, I, I don't see how that can, can can continue, I, I, and I guess it's not continuing. I agree. I mean, it's, it's fundamentally unfair. I, I, you know, talked to a, the CEO of a of a manufacturing plant for clothing in Bangladesh, and I mean, he points out that you know, it's it's not the Bangladeshis who are who are polluting their own nation or uh, driving down wages or 
flooding cities through the effects of climate change. It's, it's consumers elsewhere that are having those kinds of impacts and, and making those kinds of, you know, placing those kinds of pressures on Bangladeshi society. And it was really striking to me to, you know, to talk to him and hear, hear that perspective um, because I think maybe we've tried to convince ourselves that uh, at best, you know, the, the people who are making the products that we use uh, aren't making the link to our direct responsibility in, in Western society um, for these social and environmental consequences, but pretty clearly they are. I think that's growing, and, and we're just going to see more of that. Uh, getting closer to home, a friend of mine, he, he had to divorce his wife because her whole day consisted of going from one shop to another, buying things they didn't need and building up huge bills they really couldn't pay, and divorce ended up being the way out. I wonder if we'll need a new field of counseling for deprogramming shopaholics or, if you prefer, compulsive buying disorder. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think what's interesting about it is that, uh, I mean, the process of learning about consumption and how deeply ingrained it is actually made me more uh, compassionate, I suppose, towards people, uh, people's shopping habits, because it's a consumer society, it's a consumer economy, and there's these very powerful forces that compel us to consume $600 billion advertising industry. Um, we see right now government stimulus intended to get us back to the malls and buying things and taking flights and uh, price, you know, the, the prices set by big businesses, the interest rates set by central banks. I mean, all of these things are designed to get us out there and spending. So it's not, you know, it's not something where I, where I really think there's a ton of value in, in making individual consumers feel terrible and guilty about doing exactly what so many um, powerful forces are driving them to do. I think it's really this question of starting to look at the system itself and how we can make changes in the system that will, that will make it easier for all of us to consume less. I really don't, I think most people would agree that a lot of the consumption we do isn't providing much to our quality of life in, in the richer countries. Uh, I think most people, they may feel a slight, you know, sparks of joy, as they say, uh, from purchasing and repurchasing and buying more and more, but it's not accumulating into deep satisfaction or enduring happiness for very many people at this point. So uh, you bought a $50 broom. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things with this was realizing that um, being thrifty isn't necessarily always the the um, isn't always the way to consume less. I think we kind of mis conflate those two things. But some people are thrifty and they buy enormous numbers of goods. <laughs> and uh, so I started experimenting with this idea of you know buying fewer but better things, better quality things. Uh, and a $50 broom was one of those. And so I bought a, you know, a handmade um, broom made by local artisans here in Vancouver, um, quite a bit more than a broom I might have bought at Walmart, but, but uh, imbued with all kinds of values that are important to me. You know, I was able to hand my money over to people who, you know, I can pop by their store anytime and see them. It's repairable, and they're happy to do that for me. Uh, it's high quality. It's sweet. It's sweet like a dream, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, and it's very long lasting. So, I mean, I'll have this broom for twenty years, perhaps or more. Uh, so, I started you know, through this process, uh, changing my own consumption habits. Uh, I still am interested in buying things secondhand and so on, but um, but moving to this concept of buying fewer but better things allows us to have, surround ourselves. You know, if we're going to have objects surrounding ourselves, then why not let them be um, beautiful products that are wonderful to use? So when people get afraid of a crash or actually experience one personally, what are the first items cut from spending and what do most people see as truly indispensable, which I assume is apparently toilet paper? So toilet paper is definitely a clear winner. 
It's actually really difficult to say. I mean, I looked at this for the United States in the Great Recession. There's a number of things that are pretty clear. People will stop buying um, new cars. Basically, big ticket items fall away pretty quickly because people don't want to gamble that much money. Um, but beyond a certain point, people uh, are very idiosyncratic. I mean, we're, we're all individuals. We have very individual ways of consuming, and what's important to one person can be utterly insignificant to another. But what I do think is maybe more interesting in things like crashes is that you do see people move towards uh, things that help them with self-provisioning, so gardening supplies, uh, things that they use for cooking. You do see people acquiring um, different products that let them get out into the great outdoors, that let them get out and uh, get healthy with their bodies, because often during the crash, a lot of us have, you know, in a crash, a lot of us have more time to spend uh, doing things for ourselves. And this, of course, is one of the, you know, the great lessons of a deconsumer society is that we do trade off goods, services, and experiences to some extent, but what we get in exchange is, uh, is a lot more free time that we can invest. And what people often invest that free time in is relationships, particularly relationships with uh, friends and family and even strangers, but also in relationships with the natural world. You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. With us is journalist and author J.B. McKinnon. We are talking about his latest book, The Day the World Stopped Shopping, How Ending Consumerism Saves the Environment and Ourselves. I did not know that Finland experienced a pretty severe fall uh, during the early 1990s. How did people adapt to that? Finland was an unusual situation because they have a really unified culture and uh, they they also have a, you know quite a strongly social democratic government structure so they taxed the wealthy um, they distributed wealth they maybe more than anything else what you saw in Finland was a certain amount of relief from the direction that things had been going so at the time that the Great Finnish Depression struck in the 1990s. Finland had just gone through the same kind of um, boom as a lot of places in the West saw in the 80s. So they had they had yuppie culture. They had the greed is good mentality starting to build in Finland, and that was historically brand new in that country. Uh, it had been a you know, really strongly social democratic country up to that point. The 1990s saw relief from that and uh, a return to a sense of greater equality between individual Finns. They weathered the storm, you know, with, without, as people pointed out, without riots, without uh, mass protests. They buckled down, um, shared what they had to some extent and through the government, and, uh, and they got through it. Kind of reminds me of what people did in Iceland to... On another topic, talk to us about the links between shopping and the night sky. I never considered this until I read your book. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the kind of quirkier aspects. When I started looking into, well, what, what happens if we suddenly stop consuming so much? One of the things that came out of the research was that uh, the world starts to get dimmer. So I had not realized that uh, there's a fairly fixed Percentage. I can't recall exactly what it is right now, but there's a fairly fixed percentage of the GDP of any nation that gets spent on lighting. So when uh, when degrowth occurs, the overall brightness of a society actually starts to dim, and uh, that can be quite beneficial. I mean, we have quite a few problems with light pollution, and of course, lights burn energy. Uh, so it raised that question, you know, can we, would we be comfortable living in a, in a somewhat darker world? Is that the kind of consumption that we, the kind of shift in consumption that we would be able to welcome? And I think um, the upside, of course, is that you do end up with wonderful night skies. 
uh, you end up with much less light pollution. And the only real downside seems to be that we're anxious about adapting to a little bit more darkness. But uh, there's great variety in the cities around the world in terms of how bright or how dim they are. And so I visited Berlin, which is one of the dimmer of the large cities. And I thought it was a wonderful place to visit at night. Uh, people sitting in darkened parks, uh, dimmer streets than we see in a lot of cities around the world. Uh, personally, I found it uh, soothing and pleasant, and it was wonderful to be able to stand in the middle of a big city and see you know, two or three times more stars than I do here in Vancouver. Are you aware of the Reverend Billy Talon and the Church of Stop Shopping? You bet I am, yeah. <laughs> well, he's kind of a hero, but I think that in some of his actions, I mean, at one point he was standing in a mall with a bullhorn telling people to stop shopping um, as sort of a religious sermon, and he was arrested and taken away in handcuffs. So I started thinking about all the ways that the big system that you just described earlier will coerce us and fight off any anti-consumerism, trying to suppress it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, it really is, it's a, part of the reason that I started working on this book is because as a topic, consumption and consumerism had really fallen by the wayside. I mean, I really hadn't seen it at the center of discussions around sustainability since the 1990s. And that didn't make any sense to me, given that consumption is is uh, not only now the biggest driver of environmental crises, but it's it's getting worse all the time. So I did find, um, you know, some of the conversations I had as I tried to reach out to larger corporations and see how they respond to the idea that maybe they should be addressing uh, sustainability by by simply encouraging people to reduce their consumption. And some of those conversations became almost cloak and dagger. I mean, <laughs> within the larger corporations of the world, they, they really do not want to talk about this subject. And it was, a, it was a, a frightening topic for some people to approach uh, to the extent that they, you know, many people were either unwilling to talk to me or certainly not willing to talk to me on the record. But, at the same time, I did find you know, a lot of people are thinking about these things, and a lot of people are recognizing the nature of this problem, but uh, we need to break it out back out into the open and, and put it at the center of our conversations again. And meanwhile, the web seems to work against us. If I look at a bird bath and decide, well, I don't need a bird bath, so I'm not going to buy one of those, I get hunted for days, maybe weeks, by little pictures of bird baths everywhere I go. Uh, how, how can we change that? Should should we be going to uh, Facebook and to Twitter and, and Instagram and say, you have a part to play in the wrecking of the world. Are you going to uh, change the role somewhat? Yeah, I think these are the kinds of these are the kinds of issues that we should be looking at. Right, uh, we should be be able to opt out of these sorts of things. And if it means, if it means that we need to move towards models that are advertising free, and that means that we have to pay more for the information that we access, then that's, you know, that's part of the discussion. But we certainly should be able to opt out of uh, advertising that, that targets us in, that, in the way you described so well. Um, you know, these bird baths and pairs of pants and uh, sets of pairs of skis and things like this that pursue us through the internet, um, those are directly trying to overcome what is, what is supposed to be a good consumer habit, which is you feel that impulse to buy something and you give yourself a little time to see whether or not you really, really want to buy it. That's the kind of thing, that's the kind of impulse that helps us draw down consumption. And here we have, uh, here we have, big business and big tech specifically targeting that weakness and, and trying to break it down. So it is exactly the kind of thing that we, we want to look at uh, regulating in some way. Well, we learn a ton by looking at what would happen the day the world stopped shopping. It's hard to imagine that it will happen 
anytime soon. Maybe it will take decades. Maybe we need a time for withdrawal, or maybe we will have a revolution when people uh, finally figure out what's killing the planet. What are your thoughts? How is this going to go forward? I mean, the, the day the world stops shopping is a thought experiment in my book, right? I, 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 in order to sort of see past how we, we uh, see how we can get past this dilemma we're in, where we, we need to stop shopping for the sake of the planet, and yet we seem to have to keep shopping for the sake of the economy, I wanted to um, try this thought experiment where we just, you know, I just, on the page... Stop, make stopping shop and see how it plays out over the coming days, weeks, um, decades, even centuries. And uh, I think the way to think about it is not that we're aiming for some kind of moment when we all put our wallets away and, and never buy uh, another unnecessary thing again, but rather that we start to think about a gradual uh, change in the system towards a system that encourages more durable products and repairable products that that uh, builds the true cost of social and environmental uh, injuries into the prices of the products that we buy in the same manner that uh, carbon taxes are starting to do today. Um, we can change our cities so that there's more things that we can do in the cities that are not consumptive. Uh, there's all these different – we can draw down inequality because inequality is a big driver of consumption. So I think we're looking at more of um, – it can start tomorrow, but it's, it will play out over years in the same way that the green technology or the digital technology revolutions played out. We didn't expect those things to happen overnight, and uh, a shift to a deconsumer society – doesn't happen overnight either. It's uh, it's work at uh, every level and in every corner of society and culture. I mentioned you were a journalist. I find your work all over the place. You also teach writing at the University of British Columbia. I'm interested in your process. Uh, it seems like it's a personal one. Your 100-mile diet was certainly personal. Uh, this book sounds pretty personal the way you approached it. Is it organic? Do you know what the next thing that's going to bubble out of you will be? Are you working on something now? I'm, I'm always working on something. I mean, at this point, I've shifted back to, to uh, working on some magazine-length pieces. But I usually have a bunch of book ideas tucked away in my, <laughs> in my head. And, um, and when I finish one project, I kind of reach inside and, and look for one that's going to that I think is going to fascinate me and, and, and engage me at the level that it really has to to write a book because it's, it's a long process um, putting these things together. And this one was especially gratifying, I think, because I wasn't sure that there was a lot new to say about consumption. I mean, we've had people throughout history saying we need to consume less, we need to be less materialist, you know, we need to shop less. Um, I wasn't con totally sure that there would be something new to say about it. But when I went out and really looked at, well, what might be involved in creating a lower consuming world, then I found all these interesting people and exciting case studies from history and, and uh, really great stories to tell that illuminate uh, what could be that, the path towards that de-consumer society. Yes, you just got me thinking about a lot of history. There have been the Christian sects who renounced materialism and lived with less, and uh, of course in Asian cultures, in, in the Hindu religions, we find people who are doing that, uh, some in Buddhism. There's been a struggle to try and rearrange ourselves according to the physical world that we live in, and I think, I think your book is part of that. It's part of self-discovery in, in a big way. I think so. I mean, I, I think what people who read this book will, I, I think they'll be, they'll be entertained. I mean, it's a, the thought experiment was fun to do. It was fun to, to take the world and make the shopping stop and, and see what plays out. That was an enjoyable experience. But what comes out of it are these deeper themes of change at every level from 
the kind of choice we make when we set out to buy a product that we need to the way we orient our values and what what priorities we put at the center of our lives. And, uh, you know, it was really fascinating encountering, for example, uh, people in Namibia whose cultural practice for literally tens of thousands of years has been to live with very, very few possessions and to, you know, to, to meet and speak with those people and, and get a sense of, um, well, and really just to observe how deeply satisfying their lives appear to be. I mean, certainly as satisfying and as, as uh, rich and fulfilling as our lives, and I think in some ways more so. And those people could have gone and gotten more and stashed it away any time and did not. And that goes against everything that's holy as a Canadian. We're always banking up stuff for the next winter and uh, and maybe for our retirement 50 years away. It's a different concept of time. And I, I wonder if the Namibians were more living in the present than we are able to do. I, we'll have to call it there. Go find the day the world stops shopping, how ending consumerism saves the environment and ourselves. We all need it more than we know. James, maybe people will buy your book and then decide to stop buying books. Then what? Well, um, I mean, I guess that's a good start. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, the book is not saying let, you know nobody should ever buy anything ever. Um, and I guess I like to think that if people are buying fewer, better things, then, then I hope I've, I've written, um, I've, I hope I've written a better book, something that's going to feel worth it for people to to own and read. And, of course, there's always the library. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock.